Welcome back to the Healthy Skin Coach Show. I am your host, Takashi, helping you get clear skin and preaching to the world why food is the ultimate medicine. Today, I have a very special guest with me. His okay. name is Dr. Chris Kenobi, and he is the founder of Cure AMD Foundation. AMD stands for Age-Related Macular Degeneration, where your eyes start to deteriorate and they don't function as properly. I watched an amazing video on, um, from him uh, on YouTube, and I was fascinated at how much he knew about nutrition and about omega-3s and omega-6s, and I, I, I just had to have him on my podcast. So thank you, Chris, for joining, to, joining me today. My pleasure, Takashi. Thanks for having me on. I, I hope I can do uh, justice for, the, for your audience. Oh, I, I'm sure you can, and we'll have a great conversation. Yeah, let's first get into a little bit of your background and what inspired you to study nutrition. Yeah, sure. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm your typical uh, physician. I didn't know, I had no education in nutrition. I don't know if people realize this. They probably do, but I, I was trained in uh, your typical orthodox allopathic medical school, University of Colorado School of Medicine. I actually graduated from medical school 30 years ago, 1990. And in, in four years of medical school, I honestly do not believe we had even five minutes of education in nutrition. And anything that would have ever been mentioned would have been wrong. I mean, because it would have only supported the contention, for example, that uh, you know, for example, saturated fat increases your cholesterol and cholesterol drives heart disease. And that's probably about as far as it went as far as nutrition. And, you know, so the way that I got involved, Takashi, is that it, it was out of my own suffering. And what, and what that was is for me, and it has almost nothing to do with what I do today, but here's how I got interested is that I, when I was about 33 or four years old, I started getting arthritis and it was severe. Um, I, um, I suffered with that for about 16 years um, and went to all of my, you know, I mean, a, a bunch of my physician colleagues, family doctors, internal medicine doctors, orthopedic surgeons, even rheumatologists. And I always got the same thing for my arthritis, which was getting progressively worse and worse through my 40s. And, um, and I got the same thing, which was always a drug. You know, it was another anti-inflammatory, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, injected steroids in my knees, um, injected steroids in my elbows. And then eventually in 2011, I got a, a, a prescription for colchicine which is an immunosuppressant, which I took for one day. And then the next day I learned about the paleo diet. And, and I, I'm, not a, I'm not a paleo advocate as such today, but I'm just telling you my journey. This was 2011, I was 50 years old and I'd been suffering for you know, a good 16 years or so with arthritis and um, anyway, what happened was is that I began to learn that the paleo diet was anti-inflammatory, and that's what really made my antennae just stand straight up. And so I, I decided to eliminate grains and dairy, and in about eight to ten days, I was eighty percent better with my arthritis. But there was other things about my diet that had changed in doing that. And I won't go into that, but anyway, I'll just tell you in, in, in essence that I was so amazed that in one week of changing my diet, I had more relief than three drugs at one time could have ever given me. And I was so profoundly changed <laughs> in that one week that I began to want to learn about nutrition. And so that's what I did. And eventually it took like, I, be, I really just began to invest myself in studying nutrition. And two years later, I came across the work of Weston A. Price and I learned about how 
how westernized diets, which means essentially uh, refined flour, sugars, vegetable oils, and trans fats, essentially you can call those processed food, man-made processed food, how those drive chronic westernized disease like heart disease, stroke, cancers, hypertension, obesity, metabolic syndrome, lipid disorders, uh, um, autoimmune conditions, autoimmune diseases, yes, uh, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. And then eventually what happened was, is I uh, hypothesized that, a that age-related macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 65, that that might also be a disease driven by westernized food consumption. And that's kind of the path I went down Takashi, and eventually, I, so I, in 2015, I left practice to pursue this full time, and I published a book about macular degeneration, and I eventually founded uh, Cure AMD Foundation, uh, and and then really what happened was is I I became intensely interested in how, why, and how vegetable oils are driving so much disease. And that's a lot of where my effort has been in the last couple of years. So my, you know, so I, I kind of went from, you know, looking at the big picture down to more towards macular degeneration for several years, and then kind of went back as far as what the public sees me as, I kind of got big picture again. But my goal is to help people and to help prevent people from losing vision. But, you know, a third of our population in the U.S. and in most and in many developed nations is going to die of heart disease. Another third is going to succumb to a major cancer. And, and then a big bulk of the rest are going to uh, be affected by or succumb to diseases that are also driven by uh, by westernized diet. And those are diseases like metabolic, you know, essentially related to metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, obesity. And then we've got, you know, and then around maybe, uh, you know, 12 to 20% of the population is affected by what people might encapsulate as, as autoimmune disorders. And so, and I, I believe that, I mean, of course, the big picture is that westernized diet, which again, I would define as refined flours, sugars, vegetable oils, and trans fats. That is the big picture that's, you know, I see as at the epicenter of, of all of this disease and in the mushroom cloud are all of these chronic diseases. And, and by the way, includes the huge bulk of the skin disorders too. Yeah. Acne, psoriasis, eczema, uh, the even the even the skin cancers, melanoma, they're all part of and driven by westernized diet. It is um it you know the more I learn and I just have kind of an insatiable appetite to, to learn about this, and the more I see, the more I'm amazed at how much a, a native traditional healthy nutrient dense non toxic diet drives health and how the opposite of that drives so much disease yeah that's that's basically it takashi in a in a in a quick summary yeah i mean your story is very similar to mine we both went through a debilitating condition in order for us to you know wake up and actually study what we're putting inside our bodies and then we kind of go down this rabbit hole and just discover things that no doctor will tell you this. No dermatologist told me this. I, I saw 20 dermatologists who each gave me 20, you know, steroid creams in my lifetime. And I'm like, this, this can't be the answer. This cream, which is losing its effectiveness, cannot be the answer to my skin problems that I, you know, that I get eczema flare-ups year after year. And then just last year, I had the worst flare-up of my life. And I was debilitated in my bed, bleeding on my bed sheets, and I could not move. It was pain 24-7. And, you know, it's your skin, so you're self-conscious. You can't perform at work. You, you know, you don't want to see your friends. 
it affects every aspect of your social life. And I'm like, why is this happening to me? I, you know, I, I thought my uh, diet was healthy and yeah, I'm only 26. So it, it just seemed so odd that I was suffering. And then I went down the rabbit hole, right? And uh, just watched video after video, read clinical study after clinical study. And then I finally was able to reverse my condition by taking the best food sensitivity test in the world. It measures IgG, IgE. It's better than a skin prick test, which has a lot of false positives and false negatives. After taking this test, I discovered that what initially triggered it was red meat, dairy, and gluten, and sausage pizza. And what made it worse and worse and worse was actually tea green and black tea, which I was drinking three to five glasses every single day, thinking it was anti-inflammatory with all the epigabocatechins inside. But for my body, my immune system was interpreting the molecular structure of tea to be an antigen. And that's why my immune system was overreacting and I was seeing the symptoms in the skin. So now I recommend everyone to take a food sensitivity test. Don't follow some fad diet. Actually understand what your immune system is reacting to 170 different foods in their food, you know, chemical structures. And this test, I like I keep preaching, is the best investment for your health because you could be eating foods that are releasing all these inflammatory chemicals, whether that's histamines, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, whatever it is, there's so many of them, and you, you wouldn't even know it. And then you're just building up this inflammation inside the body. And it, at some point, your body's gonna you know, shut down. And you see autoimmune conditions, you see increased risk for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, you know, all these medical conditions pop up because we eat inflammatory foods that eventually inflames the cell membranes with omega-6s that travels to the cell nucleus and you release all these inflammatory cytokines and our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. So if your cells are inflamed, obviously your health is going to deteriorate. And uh, once, you know, once I discovered this and I kept, you know, putting the puzzle pieces together, watching video and of other, you know, leading functional medicine experts and naturopathic medicine experts and you know leading nutritionists and I, now i have this like holistic view of how i can help the world in terms of uh, nutrition and healthcare and and that's kind of been you know my journey uh it's kind of similar to yours and and trying to educate people and you right. know spread spread awareness right yeah you know it reminds me to kashi that uh, one of the things that uh, I think would be important for all of us to recognize is that this fundamental fact is that the standard American diet, uh, 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 appropriately uh, named SAD, right, um, you know, as the acronym, doesn't work for anyone. The standard American diet really is not going to work for anyone in the long term, um, but the bioindividuality of people means that there's also there's not a diet that works for everyone. So I mean, so you know, the picture that I was beginning to paint, you know, that we remove these man-made processed foods, sugars, refined flours, vegetable oils, and trans fats. You know, that is fundamental. I think that needs to be, that should be the, the fundamental that everyone takes into account and adheres to in terms of the big picture. You know, you need to get that right. And then as you found, we all have this bio-individuality that makes it such that we need to address what is, um, affecting us individually which is very very different from one person to another you know made me think of like for example one of the things i learned about my own diet this is maybe getting where i don't know if this will interest the your viewers or not but but i found in the last couple of years that i was super sensitive to oxalates 
and oxalates are extremely high in what people would be, con you know, would uh, consider as um, superfoods. And um, you may know about, you know, spinach, um, Swiss chard, potatoes, and nuts, for example. Those are all really high in oxalates. And oxalate is a tiny uh, two carbon molecule that tends to accumulate in our bodies and can set off extreme inflammatory reactions and um you know, it, yeah the, the, that's one that's one of the things but it's interesting yeah they're the main the, the main cause of around 80 to 90 percent of uh, kidney stones are calcium oxalate but what's interesting is that um, only one in 200 people that has a kidney stone uh, let me rephrase that so for every 200 people that are sensitive to oxalates only one of those will actually have kidney stones that are of oxalates. The rest will have disorders that are related to um, things like chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, uh, arthritis, like me, um, um, inflammatory conditions. You know, I don't know if you'd ever uh, interviewed Paul Saladino, but he talks a lot about the, all of the issues that, are, that surround the plant uh, the natural plant toxins, you know, that we find in all kinds of plants and how, you know, people are reacting to those, the lectins, saponins, oxalates, uh, on and on. And those could be, you know, factors in terms of inflammatory conditions for all sorts of people. So that's something that I think we all have to consider. Mm -hmm, definitely. And yeah. most people don't know that you can be sensitive to vegetables and fruits, what are considered healthy. And yeah. It, and vegetarians are like, oh, I'm healthy, but then I still experience symptoms. Why, why is this happening to me? And I'm like, you could be sensitive to exactly what you're eating. Um, and, and that's why I, you know, promote this food sensitivity test to everyone because you just don't know until you get tested everyone's guessing on their diet on their optimal diet and you could just you know it, it's 700 dollars, but f for that price it's the it was the best investment for my health and it would try it will you know it's going to help you for the rest of your life because you can prevent medical conditions from popping up so you can save time and money on doctor visits and you can actually optimize your health by eating an anti-inflammatory diet that's customized to your specific body and immune system so um you know i found out i was sensitive to healthy things like corn and yeah potatoes is one i actually have it here oh grapes is another one um, lecithins, soy lecithins. So once I know that, then I'm more, you know, cognizant about what I put in my mouth. And it's, it, again, it was the best investment for my health. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's, I, I don't eat as many oxalates anymore. Um, I, I prefer kale over spinach and I hear, you know, a lot of people, um, even, uh, I, I heard some, uh, celebrities drinking uh, too much, uh, like kale or uh, spinach smoothies, and they uh, formed kidney stones. So, uh, yeah, that, I'm kind of like scared of eating too too much oxalates. <laughs> yeah, I think it's well, oxalates have zero benefit for us, um, and uh, nothing but potential harm. Um, it, you know, it's obvious though that. Uh, while we're on this subject, and I, and I don't know if <laughs> we may be going uh, uh, astray of where you want to go, but with you know with oxalates, uh, there are there are certainly all kinds of potential uh, outcomes for people that are negative, and there's just, just zero upside for those. So I think people need to be really cautious about. Um, like these, you know, green smoothies and actually their sweet potatoes and nuts, which you know, people tend to think of those as really, really healthy. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things that for me was driving a lot of arthritis and started driving fatigue. And when I learned about that and got those out of my diet, my, my health began to recover again.
it's been journeys for for me you know on a couple of different fronts but but i wouldn't be here today and doing what i do if it weren't for my own suffering so <laughs> there was a benefit you know that that actually came out of it and and uh and now i know how to prevent at least the huge bulk of all this chronic disease and that's what i try to share with people mm -hmm. yeah and and it ignited my passion in studying nutrition and then helping people with skin conditions specifically because i suffered from severe eczema and severe um, acne and in, in college and and you know looking back my diet was trash it was garbage and yeah you know you just you don't know until someone until you suffer and you you know start watching your diet because uh, you know diet isn't taught in uh, in school and in nutrition isn't even taught in med school why why do you think that is i ha really don't understand it takashi it doesn't make any sense to me at all when i looked back at um so I graduated from medical school. I don't know. If you, I don't know if I already said this, but I graduated in 1990. That's 30 years ago, and it was really it was 21 years later when I read Lauren Cordain's book called The Paleo Answer, and that was after I started the Paleo diet. I'm not, a, and I'm not a Paleo diet fan, to be quite frank. It's okay, and it, if it, if it works for you, fine. But I'm just saying, I think there's some limitations there that don't have to you know, that you don't have to impose. But anyway, but my point is, is that when I read his book and I started understanding that the, that processed, man-made processed foods um, are driving all of this disease, I was just, you, you know, my, my, my jaw was on the floor. I just couldn't believe it. I read through the whole book again and then started you know, my own investigation to, to really dig into this um, because there was some things about it that, you know, about paleo that didn't make sense to me. But nevertheless, when I, okay, so when I started understanding this, it just hit me like a ton of bricks because um, I was thinking for all of medical school and for the next 21 years, I never questioned the fact that we as physicians in allopathic, your traditional medical schools, why are we never questioning the root cause of all this disease? It's just like when you present it, you know, the way it is in medical school, if you talk about heart disease, the first thing they're talking about is, is what happens with a plaque, you know, in your artery that could rupture and cause a thrombosis and kill you. Um, the same with a stroke, for example, you know, it starts there, but then you never go back and say, well, why do you get that? And, um, and, and it just boggles my mind that as far as I know, me and almost all of my colleague friends that were physicians of every kind of specialty, nobody's asking these questions. I mean, in naturopathic medical schools, they certainly ask that question. They're driving at what is root cause. Um, and when I, I remember when I read Lauren Cordain's book, uh, uh, The Paleo Answer, and I read that westernized diet drives acne, shocked me. I mean, I remember when I was a kid and I had acne and they said, is chocolate bad? Uh, yes, no. The dermatologist I saw um, who gave me, you know, Retin-A, cream and put me on tetracyclines and you know it worked but anyway it took you know took two drugs that I took for a few years I think and um but he didn't say one word about about diet and of course almost none of the dermatologists are going to as you've already mentioned and um but but the way but, but as far as the answer as to why is it that we're not taught this i honestly don't know i it i don't really think it's a conspiracy but it boggles my mind that the research of weston price who did phenomenal research on five continents around the world connecting you know the the as people transitioned from native traditional diets over to westernized diets and they began to consume these processed foods and they began to develop dental 
of disease, cavities, dental decay, abscesses, arthritis, cancer, um, you know, depression, suicidal ideation, all these kind of things. And, you know, modern medicine ignores all of that. They never, ever look at what is the root cause of the disease. And the way I see, you know, today, the way I see it is, is we've got, you know, we have big medicine who has, has no interest in preventing disease. Big food has an interest only in selling their products and which are so bad for us. They don't have any interest in us getting rid of these foods that are causing all this disease. And then you've got big pharma who certainly doesn't have an interest. Um, they, you know, they have every reason not to want us to prevent disease. So nobody has any, n n on a big scale, nobody has any interest in preventing disease. They have an interest in, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that they have an interest in promoting disease, but there's not, there's certainly not, there's not any money in a diet. No money in promoting good food, none, that I can, that I've ever witnessed so far. Um, it just doesn't happen. Good food comes, still comes from, I'm getting most of my food now from one farm who's nearby me here in Denver, Colorado. They're out in the, out on the pastures and I'm getting um, raw milk, raw cheese, yogurt, and uh, meat from their pasture raised cattle that are raised on grass. And the bulk of my food is now coming from one, you know, fabulous farm that raises their animals um, in traditional fashion, following Weston A. Price Foundation principles you know that's that's where the bulk of my food comes from so i actually don't have to buy i don't buy that much food from a grocery store anymore but what i do i, I mean i do you know buy organic uh produce and i don't consume all that much of it quite frankly mm -hmm. yeah I, I i got lucky where i'm staying because uh sprout is pretty close to me and it's mm -hmm. it's um you know mostly organic food. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with my grocery store in the local area. But yeah, I'm actually on the, I, I personally believe it is a conspiracy where uh, I, the big pharma has just bought off doctors and even med schools. I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, doctors oh. have zero idea on nutrition and they're just incentivized to prescribe more drugs. And people, it might, and it might fix one thing and break 10 other things inside the body. And then you look at their diet and it's just super inflammatory. It's so simple to like us who understand it, but I mean, right. the doctors, they just don't understand, which is uh, crazy. It, it boggles my mind that honestly, I think, you know, the, the physicians tend to be uh, a, a very, you know, intelligent, highly educated group. And, you know, we all have worked fantastically hard through college and medical school. We're trained in the fundamental sciences, math, physics, biology, chemistry. And then we go through medical school and it, it just boggles my mind that then we, then we go into medicine and we, and medicine is not run like like a hardcore science. Medicine has become like a business. It's driven by money. And, um, and physicians have stopped looking at, at, at this, what should be a science, like it should be looked at and, and, and practiced like a hardcore science. I mean, a physicist or an engineer would never function in our profession the way we do. In, in other words, like for example, you have, if you're a primary care physician, you're in the clinic and a, a, a pharmaceutical rep comes in and says, gosh, you know, this medicine um, will drop your patient's cholesterol by 47% and that will reduce their heart disease by 42%. And here you go, prescribe 
you know, drug statin, statin drug A. And I think physicians just go, sounds good to me. And, and it's, ju it's just, it's not respecting our scientific background and our scientific training. And we need to go back to that and really consider this profession as a science. It is not being practiced as a science. And I think that's a, that's a sad fact, but it is, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And it overwhelms the healthcare system. And yes. We spend billions, if not trillions of dollars on, you know, fixing problems that could have been prevented with just simple nutrition. It's the, it's the definition of, of it. it's just insane that we, that we think this way. I mean, now that I understand it like you do, and I see it, I see it in a completely different light. And like I said, I, I'm shocked at even myself that for so many years, I didn't que you know, question root, the root cause of, of disease um, and, and, and question, how do we get here? Keep going back. You know, if, you have, if you have eczema, what is it that's driving that? Um, rather than just throw a drug at it that may or may not help. Mm -hmm. um, we, you need to keep going back and saying, well, what is it that drives that inflammation and get back to the back to root cause for everything? Because most of these, most all of these chronic conditions um, can be treated and improved through diet, um, but you can't, can't fix them all when it's too late. You know, that's, you know, once you have a major cancer or you've had a massive heart attack or a massive stroke, um, in some of these cases, it's just too late. And, and that, that's, that's built on decades worth of consuming these westernized processed foods. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, I talk about the two main types of inflammation, which is diet, obviously, and also stress. And mm -hmm. stress triggers so many autoimmune conditions because your body just can't stop producing cortisol. Your brain is so stressed and your sympathetic nervous system is dominant. And in, in response, your adrenals are producing cortisol like none other. And then right. uh, inflammation is cumulative. So um, as the years go by, you're just constantly stressed and boom, autoimmune condition arthritis, colitis, IBD, Crohn's, whatever it is, it usually is triggered by stress. I wrote a really nice uh, blog post on that on my website, but yeah, we got to manage stress and we got to manage our diet to reduce inflammation at every level. And so not only am I healthy and trying to help others be healthy, I'm trying to help others optimize their health to achieve longevity. I'm fairly confident that I can live to 100 years old based on my diet and lifestyle choices. And I looked at the top 10 causes of death. And what I'm doing and what I'm eating is reducing my risk for autoimmune conditions, for cancers, for heart disease, for diabetes. The only thing I can't control is accidents, right? Right. Anything else I can control um, from what I put in my mouth and you know what I do with my body. So let's get into uh, a little bit about vegetable oils. Sure. And why are they so poisonous to our bodies? Let me, in answering that, Takashi, let me give you a little bit of a background so that um, the audience knows that, has some perspective because I think when we, Today, if you just look at the diet today, you would just think vegetable oils are normal because they're, um, they're ubiquitous in, in our food supply and they're ever growing. They're, the consumption keeps going up and up uh, and they are displacing the uh, animal fats, the, you know, the saturated and monounsaturated fats primarily. But if you, if you look at all this, what I did was, I mean, I literally ended up spending months and, uh, of just trying to understand the history of vegetable oils. And um, although there was, a, there was a few maybe artisanal type, types of 
vegetable oil production before uh, 1865, essentially for in up through 1865, the world, all of the world, I would say probably 99.7 or 8% of it had never seen a vegetable oil, right? They'd never seen one, never heard of it, didn't know about it. The only oils available in the world up to that point were, um, were primarily olive oil and then there was some coconut oil in a few populations like, uh, like some of the African populations. And there's a few other oils I won't go into, but just on an extraordinarily small scale. And so, um, so in, you know, up through 1865, coconut, or I mean, sorry, uh, cottonseed oil was being manufactured and primarily as lamp oil. And then it, be, and then they used it in fertilizer. And then, and they used it to a small uh, extent as machine oil, and then they introduced it into the, into as cattle feed, and it didn't kill the cattle. And so then, what they did was they started adulterating our foods with cottonseed oil. And the way they did it, the way they snuck it in, was they started putting it in butter and lard, and that's where the the and the purpose of it was butter and lard are expensive, and these oils could be made cheaply. And so they start putting the oils into butter and lard. And in 1909, we, they, they had produced soybean oil and put it on the market. And then this took off. And then after that, what happened was, is they started trying to figure out all these other ways to make these oils because they're so profitable because they could make them so incredibly cheaply since that otherwise, uh, like for example, cotton seeds was just an entire waste product of cotton production. And so, but they could, you know, they could um, crush and heat these uh, seeds and then they go through this chemical process where they're alkalinized, bleached and deodorized all chemically in order to extract this oil, which is so incredibly dangerous um, but anyway, so eventually we got, so we started with cottonseed and we got soybean, but today here's what we have in the, in the food supply is that are the really dangerous, highly polyunsaturated oils is soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. Those are the main highly polyunsaturated oils that are so fantastically dangerous to our health. And if you go back to um, to 1865, the, nobody had them in their diet at all. By 1909, um, we were consuming about four uh, grams, 4.8 grams a day of omega-6 oil. And by 1999, we were at uh, 18 grams a day. And by 2008, we were at um, 29 grams a day. So the consumption of omega-6 linoleic acid, which is the primary fatty acid of, of seed oils, uh, it's 80% of the seed oils, that, that linoleic acid alone went from, we calculated this and our, our, based on everything we understand, which will be published in our next paper, but we were consuming about 2.2 grams of linoleic acid in 1865 before we had these oils. And today that's 29 grams a day on for a typical person, for an average person in the US. And these oils, just to you know, to look at the big picture, and I don't I don't think it would benefit us to try to dig into the all the biochemistry. <laughs> it's just it, it's very difficult to understand, and especially without charts and graphs and those things. But in a nutshell, what the what omega-6s do is, is we're not properly burning them for fuel. They weren't, weren't meant to be burned as fuel. We were meant to consume these in tiny, tiny amounts, like one or 2% of our diet, instead of the current 12% of our diet, as we are here in the US and probably higher than that by now. But it was 12% or 11.8% by 2008. Um, 
So we may be higher than that now, but anyway, we accumulate these, these oils, these lino, this linoleic acid in our tissues and they are, they be, they, they set us up to, uh, to, for a pro-oxidative effect. And what I mean by, by that is that these, the um, omega-6 fats, or which is unsaturated fat, the unsaturated fats, which is omega-6 and omega-3, they have double bonds and they're subject to undergo oxidation or what we might call peroxidation when it comes to these fats. And these fats then accumulate in cell membranes and in mitochondrial membranes and all over the place, they accumulate in our fat tissue. And then what happens is they are subject to attack by free radicals. And free radicals are produced by the trillions every day in our bodies. Um, and these are things like hydroxyl radicals, superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, these types of chemicals, and they attack then the omega-6 linoleic acid, and it starts a chain reaction of peroxidation. And this, this creates extraordinary damage at the cellular, it begins at the cellular level before we have you know, a, a more systemic whole body kind of effect. But so anyway, so they're pro-oxidative, they're pro-inflammatory because they drive inflammatory molecules like prostaglandins, eicosanoids, and thromboxane that all lead to all kinds of inflammatory issues. Um, so they're pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, and, uh, and then toxic. And the toxicity comes from when linoleic acid uh, is subject to oxidative attack, it breaks down in, into um, lipid hydroperoxides, and these degenerate into all of these highly, highly toxic molecules, mostly called aldehydes. And these are things like 4-hydroxynonanol, 4-HNE, malondialdehyde, um, the HODES, which is 9 and 13 HODE, um, acrolene, and carboxyethylpyrrole, and these together, let me just say this, these together, these chemicals are cytotoxic, genotoxic, carcinogenic, mutagenic, thrombogenic, and obesogenic. So this drives everything from cancer to atherosclerosis, to insulin resistance, to obesity, to Alzheimer's disease, macular degeneration, inflammatory diseases, autoimmune, the, all of this, you can connect all of this back to seed oils. And what we see is, is populations like, like Asia, who has been, you know, they, they've been reducing their carb consumption, like white rice, and supplanting that with none other than seed oils. Primarily, um, it's primarily soybean and uh, canola um, and rapeseed. And these, and they're, and as you know, Takashi, in the Asians um, are getting as sick as we are. In fact, I think that the Caucasian European extraction population tolerates this destructive diet better than a lot of other populations. Like for example, the Japanese, they don't, they tend to remain lean, but they're getting sick. They're getting extremely sick um, from this diet. And it's driven primarily, in my opinion, by seed oils. You know, they're like the, the Japanese, their consumption of white rice in the, around 1960 was like 63% of their diet was white rice. And they were healthy. They were very healthy at that time. They weren't, th their heart disease was extremely low, m metabolic syndrome, extraordinarily low. Um, and today they're still one of the leanest uh, developed nations in the world although they have much higher 
obesity than they once did, but their vegetable oils, they went from nine grams a day of polyunsaturated oils in 1961 to 39 grams a day, a four and a half fold increase in a period of 40 years up to about 2007. And with that, they have had an explosion of all of this chronic disease. Yeah, it's all the, uh, the Western fast food restaurants just taking over Japan and then the cities in, in Tokyo. Yeah. You, you see all these you know, fast foods popping up. And, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not, you know, I mean, low carb is, you know, ha, ha, it ha, has its place. And I'm not against low carb. I think you can do low carb right if you keep your seed oils really low. But one of the things that, that, that I have learned is that when people don't even have any clue what they're doing and they go low carb and they eliminate, you know, potatoes, wheat, you know, pastas, breads, all of that, you know what they eliminate the most? I mean, what the thing they're doing that's the most valuable, I believe, and, this, and the science shows this, is that they're eliminate, they're dropping their seed oils because when you drop seed oils, always go with with carbs. I mean, you, they they go together. You know, no matter what you what it is, they're in all processed processed foods are primarily, and restaurant foods are you know primarily going to be, um, you know, grains, uh, potatoes, pasta, things like that, mixed with seed oils. That's where the bulk of the calories are, are, gonna, are going to be coming from. You know, our, today we showed and it's published evidence in 2010, 32.5% of Americans' diet was coming from seed oils and another 21% coming from sugar. That's half, more than half the diet right there from two extremely dangerous products. You put those together, and you have the recipe for metabolic disaster. I mean, and that's the recipe, for, that's the perfect recipe for acne. Perfect. You, yeah. you, you can't make a better recipe to drive acne because you're gonna drive, the seed oils and the sugar will drive insulin. They'll drive insulin like growth factor one, which will increase sebum, which will drive inflammation, creates a gut milieu that's going to you know drive um, a leaky gut um, and so you've got this perfect scenario to 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 you know create inflammation from all of these mechanisms and this is what we see I mean I was I, you know it was a long time ago but when I was a teenager in the 1970s is when it hit it you know I mean I had acne where was it coming from? It was coming from that. Uh, I mean, I was eating, you know, carbs and left, left and right. And then I discover, oh, I'm sensitive to gluten, which actually promotes intestinal permeability. So you're, right. you're promoting leaky gut. And that, oh, that makes total sense. That's why I have acne. And that's why I have eczema. Okay, I cut that out. Oh, my skin got better. It's yeah. very simple but uh, not even doctors <laughs> know that. Uh, I know, I know, it's just crazy. Yeah, it's and I, crazy. yeah, and I wanted to add for my uh, viewers and listeners that I bring everything back to inflammation. And so what happens is these omega-6 uh, fatty acids are inflaming your cell membranes and it, uh, it upregulates ericodonic acid, and right. the downstream effect. And then when that happens, <clears throat> it also upregulates inflammatory chemicals called leukotrienes and prostaglandins, specifically LTB4 and PGE2. Now, these right. two inflammatory chemicals are overexpressed in pretty much every cancer. And I studied like the, the, the top cancers like lung, breast, prostate cancers, and they all just had an increased amount of LTB4 and PGE2. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, now that I know that, I'm gonna prevent myself from getting cancer by limiting 
omega sixes, and even ergodonic acid from you know meat and eggs. So I primarily eat fish now, and I looked at the diets of the most the, the longest lifespan countries with the longest lifespans, and that's Hong Kong and Japan, and Italy is top five, and they all eat you know a lot of fish in in their diets, and so. Uh, I, you know, I want to live to 100 years old, so I've, I've been eating fish every day, and I only have, you know, cheat days once in a while, maybe once a week, once every two weeks, and that's fine. Having a cheat meal is fine if you are consistent with a healthy diet for, you know, 80 to 90% of your, you know, overall diet. So Right. Right. No, you are exactly right. And I agree with you a hundred percent. Um, you know, so we, again, as I said, you know, we, with seed oils, you're driving that, you know, pro oxidative effect, pro inflammatory, and then toxic. And then here's one more thing. That's another category. So I see it. There's four huge categories where vegetable oils, um, drive this. And the fourth one is that they're nutrient deficient. There's no vitamins A, D, or K2 in any oil, any oil, none. You only get those mostly from butter or milk. And again, and those are, those are extraordinarily different when they're from, a, you know, when they're raw versus pasteurized, homogenized, which is a processed food. Those are extreme. Those are two completely different animals, just like, you know, you know, processed food versus native food. And so, but the, but that's the last thing is that, and, and it's, it, it, it's half of the issue when it comes to cancer in my mind is that you're, when you're consuming vegetables, the more vegetable oils you consume, the fewer animal fats you will consume. And the animal fats is where you're going to get vitamins A, D, and K2. And those together are fantastically important to preventing all of this disease. And there are the vitamin A that you would get from butter and you know uh, liver, fish eggs, those kind of things, um, cod liver oil, um, raw milk, um, the, all of those, the vitamin A alone would have an immense impact on acne, for example, because I mean, that's really what they're trying to achieve with re topical Retin-A is you're putting a, a vitamin A substitute uh, um, on the skin, you know, allowing it to absorb in the skin. And, but you can take, you can take this, you know, you should, if you get this through the diet, I think that's a major player there. I can't prove that, but um, again, and this is not my area of expertise, but it's just part of the big picture that's, that I think this makes good sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get a ton of vitamin A from uh, kale and I, I make a, a kale smoothie every day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's delicious, it's nutritious, and I'm in the best shape of my life. So I know yeah. I'm doing something right. <laughs> right, right, yeah. 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 Let's talk about the healthy oils. Why are uh, olive oil and coconut oil much healthier than the corn oils? Yeah. Okay. So, so coconut oil is, is a healthy oil. Um, and the reason that it is, is because it's not polyunsaturated. It's not unsaturated. Again, as I mentioned, the unsaturated oils are the ones that are going to oxidize and go down that pathway of creating a pro-oxidative effect and creating all of the, the dangerous toxic uh, chemicals like the aldehydes. And so coconut oil is around 89 to 94% saturated. It only has, and then it has some monounsaturates in there. So it's, I think it's around 2% polyunsaturate. That's extremely low in the polyunsaturates, which makes it extremely stable, um, both you know for uh, like even high heat cooking, and it's stable in your body. Um, and this is why 
there's a massive amount of evidence that it's being used healthfully um, by populations like the Catavans and by, by Africans, you know, that, that used it extensively, that consumed it extensively and were very, very healthy. Um, the Tokelauans, they're another population that consumed, their diet was 48% saturated, um, all coming from coconut oil and they were extremely healthy. Um, and so olive oil is, uh, is largely monounsaturated and I, you know, it varies uh, quite a lot in terms of what the monounsaturated amount is. But if we talk about, um, I mean, I think it's ballpark 60 to 80% monounsaturated and that is a much more stable fatty acid. But the, I did see a study where something like 500 different olive oils have been analyzed and they ranged in terms of their polyunsaturated content from 2% up to around 20%, I believe it was. So they have quite a range. And, um, but that polyunsaturated part is the, un, is the unstable part again. And you don't wanna have a lot of those. But what I would say is even more important than that is, is if you get a, a, a true, authentic, good quality, cold pressed virgin olive oil, you are gonna get a good product and it's gonna be pretty darn safe in terms of your consumption. But in the, if you don't, I don't know if your audience knows this, but 80% of the so-called olive oils in the US are adulterated with the cheap, dangerous polyunsaturated oils and olive oil has been subject to this since the 19th century because it is an expensive oil to make and it is easy to adulterate it with these cheap oils like um, soybean oil and canola oil and corn oil and all the others that it adult it, you can adulterate it easily and Americans for the most part don't know the difference because they can't taste the difference. Um, a lot of the Italians actually, and, and you know, people that are used to having good quality olive oil, they can taste, they taste the difference and they know it's, that it's adulterated, but there are, there are good scientific studies and it is, you know, proven that at least 69 to around 80% of, of the oils, the so-called olive oils in America, most of which have come out of Europe, they are adulterated with the cheap oils. So even if you just have a, a, a bottle, you know, that, I mean, it, it says it's extra virgin olive oil, it may not be. Mm. There's a very good chance it won't be. Yeah. And so those are dangerous. Those are very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so hard to um, know what, what's actually inside. You have, you know, uh, marketing or the, the packaging can be confusing. It's designed to you know confuse you so that you actually buy it but um, it, it might not be as honest uh, with the ingredients inside and right yeah uh, most people fall for it unfortunately um, yeah the the fraud and this is a fact the fraud in olive oil production and marketing is the is greater it's greater for olive oil than any other food known hmm. and that's worldwide even olive, like i said because olive oil is expensive and it's easy to adulterate and it's not a it's it's generally not considered a crime in the u.s it is considered a crime um in uh italy i believe it is and and is they are prosecuting the some of those organizations that have produced uh, adulterated oils um, because they're adulterating them with up to 40 or 50 percent you know cheap oils and then even the other part of the so you know oil that should be extra virgin is not necessarily even that doesn't even meet the criteria for that there's a lot of criteria that need to be met to produce a really good you know, EVOO, extra virgin olive oil that is cold pressed, you know, uh, 
handled in all the, pro the appropriate ways to produce a good quality oil. But we just don't have very many of those in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And don't even get me started with supplements. I mean, that, that's like, I would say, 99% marketing. And if they were actually lab tested, most of them don't have what they claim to have inside. It's Yeah, it's, it's hard as a consumer to know what is actually good for us. And until you study it and have some you know expert tell you what is good and what is bad, then we, most of us just have no idea what we're putting inside our bodies. Right. I, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. I, I'm, I mean, the, uh, I, I mean, I know, I know for a fact that there are, ex, there's an extraordinary number of supplement companies that they couldn't care less what's going into that bottle. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, as Sally Fallon from the Weston A. Price Foundation says, it's, it's a commo it, they're just considered commodities. It's not about our health. It's a commodity to make a company money. And that's the way agriculture sort of be, you know, much of agriculture became. It's, it, you know, we, they, see, they see food as a commodity first and foremost, just like medicine now is, you know, being treated like a business rather than a science. As I said, a, an art and a science to, to, to make people's lives uh, healthier and better. You know, I mean, there's just so much of this is driven by economics, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any thoughts on flaxseed oil? Because it has more uh, omega-3 uh, polyunsaturated fat than the harmful omega-6 uh, polyunsaturated fat. Um, yeah, I, that, that's not something I know that much about. Um, um, I will tell you this. Um, I think, you know, you know, freshly pressed uh, flax seeds could produce a healthy oil, just like freshly pressed olives can, can produce a healthy oil. Um, I, I think you, I mean, I almost hate to say it, but you could produce some oils that are healthy uh, as long as the conditions are very, very good, you know, favorable for that. I'm not a fan of supplementing with even omega-3s. I think we should try to get them from our diet and you know the you know, fish uh, especially especially wild caught fish you will get uh, and, and smaller fish you know like salmon you will get a fantastically healthy source of omega 3s and but to, but in in my way of thinking when you from what i understand now because i dug so deeply into the science of what goes wrong with unsaturated fats, which is omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, all of those that are unsaturated, when you pull them out of their native product, like, like a fish or a flaxseed, and you put it into a bottle or into a capsule, and then it's stored at room temperature, exposed to heat, exposed to light, even that is going to oxidize to a degree even omega-3s. And so I think you have to be extremely cautious about that. I'm much more in favor of just getting them in their native uh, source and consuming them from where they should come from. And you can get those, you get all you need in grass-fed cattle, grass, you know, pasture-raised uh, uh, mutton, you know, sheep or, um, or, uh, or, you know, wild caught fish. I mean, you can get it from all kinds of animals. You get all you need from the, you know, hooved animals. Like you could get all you need from uh, deer and caribou, just like, uh, like the um, uh, um, uh, Eskimos and the Inuit did. I mean, they got, they got, I mean, they consumed a lot of, um, you know, mammal, sea mammals like, um, seals for example but that's where they're getting their omega-3s was from animals yeah and uh i think that's where we need to get our omega-3s we're not deficient in omega-3s we get we get about two and a half times more omega-3 today than in our diets than we did 
in 1909. Um, and it's at least that if you compare it to 1865 when we didn't have any seed oils, it's at least that much more. We're getting that much more omega-3, even in a standard American diet. We're not deficient in omega-3. We're just, we're, we're, we, but we just didn't have a massive amount of omega-6. I mean, the ratio is, went, you know, in terms of omega-6 to omega-3, went from about one to one to two to four to one possibly is now, as you know, 15 to 20 to one, but it's not about the ratio. It's about, to, it's, it's more about the absolute numbers and the absolute numbers is what's killing us. We need, the only way to fix your omega-6, omega-3 is to get the omega-6s out of, I mean, the, the omega-6 is coming from seed oils, vegetable oils, out of your diet. There's no other way to fix it. Mm -hmm. No I, other way. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that, but I also disagree with you that um, that we need more omega threes, uh, not only from the diet but from supplements. But I do agree with you that they get uh, oxidized quickly, so majority of the fish oil pills are not that bioavailable. And there's only one company in the world that makes bioavailable. Um, uh, omega-3 oil and it, they combine it with olive polyphenols to make it uh, more stable mm -hmm. so that it doesn't oxidize quickly so um, I, I you know I promote that that product on my website it's called the balance oil by Zinzino and I actually talked to the leading scientist who created it Dr. Paul Clayton and you should look into his research it's it's really fascinating how um, the, you know, the importance of omega-3s and how standard supplements uh, get oxidized too quickly. So people who take the, the standard supplements still have a ratio of 16 to 1. The average American is about 25 to 1. Right now, uh, I took an, uh, a Zenzino omega-3 test. And pr uh, before I was taking any omega-3 supplements, my ratio was five to one and a healthy level is around you want to be below three to one and um and uh, yeah our ancestors were uh you know ha ha had the optimal level of one to one so i'm trying to get below three to one and trying to get to one to one so mm -hmm. so every so for for the viewers out there for every omega-6 you take in you can inhibit the inflammatory effects by taking in an omega-3. Again, I'm all about reducing inflammation in my cells to get clear skin, but also to be able to live to 100 years old. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't really disagree with you. Um, uh, and there's absolutely no question. The omega-3s are far less likely to oxidize than omega-6s are. Even, you know, you put them both in a bottle the omega threes are are more stable uh, under the same conditions uh, as compared to the omega sixes. So I'm not opposed to supplementing those. I'm just trying to get the big picture, you know, for the huge bulk of people that they need to see and understand first of all that you can't fix this problem just by supplementing with omega threes. You've got to get the seed oils out of your diet. Um, and the only way to do that is to is to know where they are, pay attention to processed foods, get rid of those. You know, don't put a, don't put the seed oils, the vegetable oils in your food. Caution when you eat out, all those kind of things. And so, yes, if you got a really good quality omega three supplement like that, um, I I can see any issue with that at all. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I think that could be, I think that could be healthy and could do exactly what you're, you're doing because they compete, you know, for, they, they, they compete with the same enzymes for elongation. And so, yeah, I don't see any, I don't see any issue with that, but people, I just need to, you know, make sure that I, uh, I'm trying to get, you know, the big picture out there to folks that may not know about this. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, this has been an amazing conversation. Is there anything else that you wanted to um, to add or, or talk about? Um, the only thing is that I would just mention that um, 
I uh, work for Cure AMD Foundation. We're at Cure AMD, that's for age-related macro degeneration, um, cureamd.org. We are totally nonprofit. Um, I do not accept any compensation from this organization or from anything that I do, books sold or any of that, all goes to the organization because we, our main goal is to save the site. They're actually, by the way, a um, little off topic for your audience, but around 540 people probably in the world go blind every day from age-related macular degeneration. I believe every single case can be prevented. Um, just like all the people dying of heart disease and cancer, we can prevent the massive bulk of this with changes in diet. So they, anyway, people can who want to reach out to me can go to our website, cureamd.org, and they can go to the contact form and send me a message and learn about learn more from there and they can find me on you know some of my presentations on youtube just by googling my name chris c-h-r-i-s kenobi k-n-o-b-b-e you can go there and learn more about what i do and and about our organization but we're we're funded solely by charitable contributions that help support and get the message out we're just trying to reach people with a good message Definitely. Awesome. For the billions of viewers and listeners out there, please check out his site and contact him if you have any questions about nutrition or about uh, macular degeneration. And yeah, it's Cure AMD Foundation. And uh, uh, yeah, Chris, thank you so much for joining the past podcast. This has been an amazing conversation. I hope you have a great day and stay safe and uh, stay quarantined in this crazy times you're living in. We'll do it. Thanks, Takashi. It was an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.